Okay, this is a continuation of the practice test for Math 1140 pre-calculus. We're covering the topics in Exam 1, which were Appendices 3 and 4, and Sections 4, 5 through 4, 7. We've moved to the last batch of problems in the practice test, numbers 42 through 48, which come from Section 4.7, as indicated at the top of the practice test. So, picking up with number 42. 42, it says, information is given about a polynomial whose coefficients are real numbers. Find the remaining zeros. And it says that the degree is 5, so one thing you need to know um, to do this problem is the theorem regarding how many zeros do you have, because the number of zeros that you have is the same as the number of factors that you have. And so if it is degree 5, according to this theorem from section uh, 4.7, that if it is nth degree, and let me move it down a little bit, every complex polynomial of degree n greater than or equal to 1, if the degree is greater than, to equal, greater than or equal to 1, then that function has exactly n complex zeros. And when they talk about complex zeros, remember zero, the zeros are the solutions. And just because they're calling them complex zeros, you just need to remember that complex numbers can look like this. So you could have a zero that looks like this. You could have, this is also considered complex. It's just missing the imaginary portion. This is also complex, but it's miss missing the real portion. So any of these are considered um, complex numbers. So when you read that theorem, you know, don't be swayed by the word complex. Just whatever the degree is, whatever the highest degree is, that's how many, or whatever the degree is, which is determined by the highest power in the function, that's how many zeros there are. Okay, they are just referred to as complex zeros because complex can mean several things. A real number, an imaginary number, or a combination of the two. Okay, so that is one thing that plays into this problem, number 42. If it is degree 5, that means that there are 5 zeros in this problem. Yet you are only seeing 3 of them. They're telling you that 9 is a 0 that 5 plus 5i is a 0, and that negative 9i is a 0. That means that there are two more zeros that aren't being shown here, and you need to know what they are to answer this question. So that brings um, into the problem the need to know the, you need to know the conjugate pairs theorem. And this just says that if f is a polynomial function whose coefficients are real numbers, um, that if a plus bi happens to be a zero, then its conjugate is also considered a zero, and that's how you're going to get the two additional zeros. So let's say 3 plus 2i is a solution. That means 3 minus 2i is also a solution. So you know, need to know how many there are total from the first theorem that I showed you so that you know that there's two missing here. Okay, we need five solutions all together, and then you also need to know that if you do have a complex solution, you can just switch the sign on the imaginary portion to get its conjugate solution. So, let's see, what are the other, find the remaining solutions, 5 minus 5i. So, let's see, here's one right here. No, this has got an extra one right here. We The only ones we need to show, we already have three of the solutions. We need a total of five, so we just need an answer that has positive five minus five i. That's that right there. And then the opposite of this one. The opposite of this uh, complex solution would be positive nine i. So given any kind of a solution with an imaginary portion, switch the sign on the imaginary portion. So that would be this one, opposite of negative nine i. Those are the two that were missing. So those are the remaining zeros. Okay, so there's no work to do there. You just have to know um, the theorems. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say with respect to that.
these two theorems. that we used in this problem. And one had to do with if the uh, polynomial is nth degree, then there are n complex solutions. That was the first theorem that I showed you. And so in this problem, I knew that there were five solutions, but there were only three that were showing. Therefore, there were two that were missing. Two solutions were missing in this problem. Now, you don't need to write this out. I'm just giving you something as my reasoning. I'm writing out my reasoning. I'll try to make this look not so crazy. I guess it doesn't look any better, but <laughs> it's nth degree. Okay, and so then the other theorem that I discussed with you is that it was called the conjugate pairs theorem. That one actually had a name, conjugate pairs theorem. And basically all that said is that if um, A plus BI is a solution, then A minus BI is a solution and that's what allowed us to finish this problem we knew that there were two missing because only three were shown and there had to be five solutions here because it was fifth degree that was information given in this problem so two solutions were missing and um, of the solutions that were given Two of them had imaginary portions, these complex solutions here. And all you had to do is switch the imaginary portion. So that gave me that and that. Okay, so here if 9, 5 plus 5i, and, um, oops. And negative 9i were solutions, but that, mean, that meant that also 5 minus 5i and positive 9i. And that was a total of five solutions. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, going to 43, same type. Uh, maybe the directions are different there. Let's check that out. Okay, so 43, form a polynomial. Oh, this one, this time it doesn't say just give the missing solutions. It says form a polynomial with the real coefficients having the given degree and zero. So, the degree here is 3. The zeros that I am being told about are negative 4. That'll help me get the polynomial I'm looking for. And then they give me this other solution, 3 minus 2i. Well, from the previous problem, number 42, if 3 minus, 3, uh, 3 minus 2i is a solution, then... 3 plus 2i is a solution. So when you try to go and get the polynomial of degree 3, remember that what the solutions look like when they're given as zeros, the finished solutions is what you're being given here. And what, what they look like when they're in factored form, because you're going to start with factored form, multiply those factors out and be able to come up with the polynomial because that's the end goal here to come up with a polynomial with these particular solutions or zeros same thing okay so if you're going to put these back in factored form just switch the sign of each of these zeros each of these solutions so instead of at using a positive four a negative four would be x plus four and then, you know, what? if you want to switch, you know, this whole solution, because you're switching the sign, and that's easy to do when it's just a single term, just switch that one term. But when you're trying to switch both terms, then you got to remember it's going to be x minus the whole thing. You can use double parentheses, or you can use brackets if you want. 
and then this would be x minus 3 plus 2i. Okay, then we're going to clean this up a little bit. Can't do anything here, just copy it. And this is going to be x minus 3 plus 2i. If you apply this negative, it's x minus 3 plus 2i. And then x minus 3 and minus 2i. Now we still have to get all of this uh, multiplied out. So I'm going to try to employ some shortcuts here for foiling, specifically with respect to these two factors, because they are conjugates, even though you may not uh, recognize it. And I did teach you a shortcut for multiplying conjugates. I said that if you have uh, x minus a, whatever, two terms, and then you have that same expression, but with opposite signs, then all you have to do is square the first term, square the second term, and then put a minus in between them. And we're going to try and use that here or else you're going to run into an awful lot of steps right here. So let me, um, you know, point out to you why these are conjugates, because you can think of this as the first term. Okay, we'll just move those parentheses from being in the back to being in the front now so that you can truly see that they are conjugates and therefore the conjugate foiling shortcut applies. We can let this be the first term. See, so that, that means that the first term matches on both of those. Uh, a term can have more than one, an expression can have more than one term in it. And then this will be the back term. So you got a positive 2i here and a negative 2i here. Fronts match, backs match, opposite signs. That's exactly what conjugates are. So we're going to multiply these like that. So I was telling you that if you had conjugates, and again, front terms match, back terms match, signs are different. You just square the front term, square that front term, that being the x minus 3, <coughs> and square the back term to get all of this multiplied by, out three terms by three terms. Just be doing it by shortcut. And then throw a minus in between them. This one, very easy to square out. This one, we're going to have to apply another shortcut. <coughs> so when you square this out, you're going to square out the 2. You're going to square out the i. So this will be 4i squared with a minus in front of it. i squared is defined as negative 1. And then times negative 4 is really plus 4. So that back term turned out to be plus 4. Here, what you're, wanting, what you're going to want to employ so that you don't have to make a bunch of work out of this is square, double, square. Because you're supposed to be foiling this out. But if you're going to rewrite this as x minus 3 times x minus 3, and then do all that foiling, then you're opening yourself up to another five steps. I don't think you need that, so please learn the shortcuts. You can leave it just like this. You don't have to expand it. You don't have to draw the arrows, and you don't have to uh, collect like terms. <clears throat> this will do all of that in these three steps. So squaring means square the front term. Doubling means use these two uh, terms to make a product and then double it. So it's very easy to do in your head. 3 times x. Don't worry about the negative. We can put that in negative. Or you can do it right now. Negative 3 times x is negative 3x. And by the time you double that, that's negative 6x. If you don't want to think about the negative, it's just 3 times x. Double that uh, 3 and you get 6x. And then that sign that's in the parentheses, bring it down in front. Now square again. Square the back. And that's positive Nine. <clears throat> so I have everything uh, foiled out, and the only two terms I see that I can combine is the nine and the four to give me thirteen. Don't forget, in front of all of this was this x plus 4. So now bring that back down into it. You're trying to come out with an overall polynomial that fits the description 
of the zeros that you are given. <clears throat> okay, so we are creating the original polynomial. Okay, so we have one thing left to do, and that's to get this foiling done, because you're not going to leave it in factored form. Notice that the answers that you're being, in given, you're being given in 43 have no parentheses in them, which means you need to continue foiling until you get just one polynomial, no parentheses. So put the shorter one in the front. We have that, only two terms. This has three terms. We're going to do extended foiling here. We're going to multiply x by each of these terms. There's no shortcut for this. I used any, every shortcut that I could possibly use on the way to getting to this point. Then we're going to multiply 4 by each of these terms. Okay, so doing the upward arrows first. x times x squared, x cubed. x times negative 6, negative 6x squared. x times 13, 13x. Now doing the upside down arrows, small, medium, then large. 4 times x squared is 4x squared. 4 times negative 6, negative 24x. 4 times 13 is 52. Okay, now combine like terms for your final polynomial. Okay, so that's x cubed. And then on your x squared terms, we have negative 6 plus 4. That's negative 2 on your x squared term. Okay, then for your x terms, we have 13 uh, minus 24, and that is negative 11. That takes care of the x terms, and then we have a positive 52. And then let's <clears throat> look at those answers. So for 43 cubed minus 2x squared minus 11x. This one looks good. Uh, x cubed minus 2x squared minus 11x plus 52. So yes, 43 is C. Okay, moving on to 44. Okay, so in problem 44, <clears throat> we are told once again that this is degree 3. These are not easy problems because they have a lot of steps. <clears throat> and you're told that the zeros are negative 2 and 3 plus i. So I'll run you through these steps again. If 3 plus i is a, is a 0, in other words a solution, then so is 3 minus i. That's from the conjugate pairs theorem. Okay, then if you want to come up with a polynomial, you have to know how to turn the zeros into factors. Okay, so now what we're listing is the factors. When you're listing the factors, these zeros will have the opposite sign that they do now. You, you accomplish that by going x minus whatever the zero is. And then x minus this zero. And I know some of you are just going to jump right into going x plus 2. That's fine. And then x minus the next zero. Okay, so this one cleans up to x plus 2. <clears throat> this one will be x minus 3. We apply the minus to the 3 as well as to the i, minus i. This one will be x minus 3 plus i. Okay, then those parentheses that were in, in the back, let's push them up to the front so that we can recognize that these two things are conjugates. And therefore, if I'm going to multiply them out so I can get the final polynomial, I have to realize that they're conjugates. The x minus 2 will play the role of the first term, and the negative i and positive i will play the roles of the back terms. So 
Noticing that the front terms are the same and the back terms are the same, yet the signs are different, makes those conjugates. So you can multiply them out by the conjugate formula, which just says square that common first term, square that common back term, and throw a minus between the squares. That's how you get two conjugates foiled out but by way of a special formula, in other words, a shortcut. So if I was going to completely continue working with this, I've already applied the formula for shortcuts, but I have a little bit more work to do. I need to, because this first term has more than two, more than one item in it, two items, I'm going to have to foil this out again. So the shortcut for squaring a binomial, there's a shortcut for that as well. There's one for conjugates, square minus square, and there's one for squaring a binomial, it's square double square. So squaring that front term, I get x squared, doubling the product of these two, 3 times x is 3x, the double of that is 6x, put that minus right in there, because um, this second term will take on the sign of what, what do you see in the parentheses. And then square out that back number to do the second square. And then this is minus i squared is the same thing as negative 1. Okay, continue working with that. Combining like terms, which would mean combining the 9 and the positive 1. So x squared minus 6x plus 10. So all of this multiplied out, 3 terms times 3 terms, turns out to be x squared minus 6x plus 10. Okay, and all the work that you were doing to get that multiplied out. Drop down the other term that I haven't been writing each time, which is the x plus 2. We're trying to get just one polynomial that represents the given conditions. Okay, keep going with that, and again, we are left with multiplying a 2 by 3. So we're going to take this x and multiply it by all three items over here. Then we're going to take the 2 and multiply by all three items. That's why you want the shorter polynomial in the front, the one with 2 up here and the one with 3 back here, because then the arrows will not crisscross. Okay, so x times x squared, x cubed x times negative 6, negative 6x squared, x times 10, 10x, 2 times x squared is 2x squared, 2 times negative 6 is negative 12x, and 2 times 10, 20. Okay, so then we're going x cubed when we combine like terms. On my x squared terms, I have negative 6 plus 2. Let me check something. I feel like I'm doing the same exact problem. No, that one had no, almost the same. <laughs> okay, so when... When I combine my x squared terms, I have negative 6 plus 2. That's negative 4. Okay, so I've done the cube terms, squared terms. And as far as the x terms, it would be this plus this, which is negative 2x. And then there's a positive 20. Okay, and that's my finished polynomial. And let's see what we have to offer here for answers for 44. Okay, so we have x cubed minus 4x squared minus 2x plus 20. Okay, so for 44, answer is B. That's the correct answer. You have the answer key attached to the practice test, so you can check your work as you do them yourself. Okay, and then 45. Okay, then in problem number 45, it says use the given use the given zero to find the remaining zeros. 
Okay, so we're this time they're giving us the final polynomial, so they're coming at us a different way this time, giving us the final polynomial and one of the zeros. You can use the conjugate zeros theorem here that if this is a zero, then this is also a zero. And if you want to get um, some of the factors, because you can't get all the factors, this thing has four zeros, four solutions. You only have some information about two of them. You know that this is a zero and this is a zero. You know you have two imaginary solutions. And you can get factors from those, but you can't write all of the factors as we could in numbers 43 and 44. So we're going to go in the back way here. We are going to take um, the two factors that we do have and form like a mini polynomial and divide it into this to get the other factors. Okay, so let's transfer this over. So for 45, they're telling us that f of x, let's move this up a bit, that f of x is equal to x to the fourth minus 32x squared minus 144. We know that this is a, a zero, negative 2i, and therefore by the conjugate pairs theorem, this is a solution. So the factors that go with that are x minus negative 2i and x minus positive 2i. You can clean this up as it becomes x plus 2i, that double negative, and this one doesn't have a double sign. So you can actually get a factor here that we can divide into this polynomial to get the other factor that remains here because we can't find all the factors the way we did in 43 and 44 because in 43 and 44 they told us what all the solutions were where we had a very quick way of knowing what all the solutions are and we just don't have that information here. There are four solutions yet we've only been given two rather than all of them. So here we go. We're going to multiply this out. We're going to use a shortcut for foiling here, and that's because these are conjugates. So we can just go square minus square. You can either be looking here or here when you go square minus square. I'm going to square the front term. I'm going to square the back term. So square that, square that, you get 4i squared, and throw a minus in between those two squares. Okay, then simplify this i squared term. i squared is defined as negative 1. And therefore, we have x squared plus 4. Negative 4 times negative 1 is plus 4. And we are going to divide this mini polynomial into the original polynomial f of x. We'll divide this polynomial into f of x because if we can get the remaining factor off of f of x by dividing this into it then we can find the other zeros and that's exactly what this says to do find the remaining zeros right now and it doesn't say whether they need to be real or imaginary in fact you know all of section 4.7 was regarding complex numbers, which involves all you know the imaginary type solutions. So out of the four solutions, we have two of them. We still have two more to find. So here we go into the division process. We're going to take the polynomial that we have created and divide it right into, this is why you needed to know long division, because the synthetic division is only for dividing by linear divisors, in other words, first degree. Okay, and we're dividing into this, which is fourth degree. There is no third degree term. Um, there is a second degree term. Oops, I better move some of this over. Get rid of this to give me some more room. 
Uh, we don't have a first degree term, but we do have a constant. All right, so let's start the process. What do we multiply this by? We're always trying to figure out what to multiply when you're doing long division, what to multiply that leftmost term by to get the leftmost term here. So this times x squared would give you x to the fourth. Now use it to multiply by everything out here. So this will be x to the fourth plus 4x squared, so put it in the x squared column. Now subtract the whole bottom row, which means switch the signs of each term in the bottom row and combine it with the row above. So this would cancel and bring this down. But, you know, if you try to ask yourself, what do I multiply this by to, to create this, it would just be zero. So. You don't even really need to bring that term down. It's just a space holder in case you get third degree terms. So you can bring it down, but really what you're trying to create is um, this second degree term. Okay, so this is going to be negative 32 minus 4 is negative 36x squared. And you can bring these other terms down. Okay, so can't create 0x cubed out of x squared because that would just be a 0 term in there and thus there'd be no point for it. So x squared times what gives you this? Negative 36. Negative 36 multiplied by x squared is negative 36x squared. Negative 36 times 4 is uh, negative 144. So we didn't end up needing the x cubed or the x column because we have zeroed out at this point. Now subtract the whole bottom row, which means switch the signs on the bottom row. So that cancels. Negative 144 plus 144, that cancels. So we have nothing left. So you can stop the division. So what we found out from the two zeros that we were offered in the instructions, those led us into this polynomial, taking this polynomial and dividing it into the main polynomial gave us a new factor, which we also refer to as the quotient. So this new factor is going to give us the rest of the solutions. And let me write this an even better way your original polynomial x to the fourth minus 32x squared minus 144 in factored form is this quotient that you really got up here is really a factor x squared minus 36 and then the other part of um, this x to the fourth minus 32x squared minus 144 is what we got right here from the zeros that they gave us x squared plus 4. See, that's just what it looks like in factored form. Now, we already know the zeros that this one gave because we worked those zeros backwards just to get x squared plus 4. We took those zeros and switched each of their signs. We went x minus the zero we were given, x minus the other zero we were given, multiplied them together just to get this. So we already know the solutions that would be afforded to us by way of that factor. And they were negative 2i and 2i. But now this other factor gives us the other two solutions. We just have to work to get them. What makes um, this factor equal to 0? Well, just set that equal to 0 and solve it. That would require you to bring this negative 36 to the other side. I mean, you could factor it, but you could also do it by the square root property. You could have factored that. Or you could do it the way I'm doing it. Take the square root here. Take the square here. When you're um, solving by the square root property, you are to record both the positive and negative root. Always when you're solving something of even degree, and having to use an even type of radical to get to the solutions. So square root of x squared makes the square go away and you get plus or minus 6. 
Okay, you now have all four solutions. You know that the solutions are negative 6, positive 6, negative 2i, and positive 2i. And you were given two of these, and we found the other two. Okay, and those were the solutions. Oh, this one just said find the remaining zeros. So let's see. That would be the 2i. That was um, one that was not given to us. We got that by the conjugate pairs theorem. If this is a solution, that's a solution. And then we actually found the other two algebraically, which were um, positive 6 and negative 6. So that would be this answer right here. Okay, so 45 is C. They didn't want you to mention the answer that they had already given you, and that's why it's missing from here. <clears throat> okay, moving on to 46. Almost done with the practice test. Okay, all I've done is given you just another opportunity to practice that same skill. So you've got plenty of problems to practice with here. And then you have a review in my math lab as well. You should do that first. Okay, so then this is um, and if you and you know, if you really want even something more, you could go into the multimedia library. Just use your my math lab link, go into the multimedia library. It'll be one of the options there when you press the My Math Lab link in your Blackboard shell, and uh, you can pick test prep videos. But I don't know that there's going to be one that covers just Appendix 3, 4, and 4, 5 through 4, 7. So you could um, pull up the test prep video, but then um, just use the problems from that section. Anyway, I think what I've given you is enough between your my math lab review and this uh, practice test which has almost 50 questions on it so minus okay so let's see let's concentrate here minus 22 x cubed plus 64 x squared minus 58 x plus 13 and it says that one of the zeros is um, 3 plus 2i. Okay, again, we're going to start this off with the conjugate pairs theorem. So if this is a zero, then so is this. Just switch the sign on the imaginary portion. That, that is the conjugate of this. And all complex solutions come in conjugate pairs. Okay, so the kind of mini polynomial that we can get out of this is achieved by putting them in factor form. So it would be x minus 3 plus 2i. So that would be one of them. And then the other one would be x minus. Okay, here was one of the solutions. Now we're going to put the other one in here. Okay, now, what I would suggest so that you see that these are conjugates, even though now you have three um, items and three items here, they're still conjugates, but you just need to move this set of parentheses around the zero that they offered you, move them up to the front and put it around the first two items. So the polynomial that we're going for here, which we are then going to divide into the main polynomial called f of x, would be... And you can even use brackets if you want to instead of double pairs of parentheses. So move the parentheses up around those two. So this will be considered the first term. And so it's x minus 3. That's where I got that. And then negative 2i. That negative um, impacts both of these terms. Okay, so we have this that we're going to multiply with this. Again, move these parentheses, bring them those parentheses, so that they 
encapsulate the first two terms. Okay, this was minus 3, x minus 3, there it is right there, and positive 2i. Opposite of negative 2i is positive 2i. So maybe now you can see that these are conjugates. Front terms are the same, back terms are the same, signs are opposite of each other. That's all you need for those to be conjugates. And since these are conjugates, you can FOIL them using the shortcut for conjugates because you need to FOIL here. But if you're going to do all those steps, that's a lot. So you can use this shortcut for FOILing conjugates, square minus square. You can either be looking at this or this, one or the other, not both. Okay, so we're going to square this first item. Then we're going to square the second item. And we're going to throw a minus, just a minus in between them, just like the shortcut says. Okay, as you go to um, FOIL this out, this is what can be FOILed out. You're squaring a binomial, and that has a shortcut in and of itself as well. That shortcut is square double square. The shortcut we just used is for conjugates. This, these are not conjugates right here. This just says x minus 3 squared. So when you see that you're squaring a binomial, that's when you can use this. So squaring that first term, x squared. Doubling the product, well, 3 times x is the product. So when you double that, you get 6x. And that minus that's in the original parentheses goes right there in front of that second term. Now square again, this time squaring the back. Okay, then this is going to be minus 4i squared. I'm going to put that right here, minus 4i squared. But then when you go negative 4 times the definition of i squared, you get positive 4. Okay, then this 4 can be combined with the 9 so that it is x squared minus 6x plus 13. So we have this little mini polynomial that we are going to divide into f of x to get the other factor because right now we just know that this is fourth degree and out of the four answers that we should have for a fourth degree uh, function these are two of them we need to find the other two so the way we do it is by taking this mini polynomial we've created from the given zeros and dividing it into the main polynomial so we're going to be dividing x squared minus 6x plus 13 into 3x to the fourth minus 22x cubed plus 64x squared minus 58x plus 13. Okay. All right, so remember when you're doing long division, you are just looking to figure out what do I need to multiply the leftmost term by in order to create the leftmost term here. In this case, it would be 3x squared. So 3x squared times x squared is 3x to the fourth. 3x squared times negative 6 is negative 18x cubed. And 3x squared times 13 is 39x squared. Okay, once you take that term in the quotient and multiply by everything out front, then it's time to subtract, which just means switching the sign of each of these terms and combining it with the row above. So 3 minus 3, x to the fourth um, column is gone. Then negative 22 plus 18. Uh, that would be 4, and it would be negative 4, because the bigger number is negative, so negative 4x cubed. 
Okay, then on this x squared column, it's going to be 64 minus 39. That's why you should circle your switch signs so you pay attention to them. So positive. Yeah, I'm just trying to read my writing here. Okay, so the 64 minus 39 would be, let's see, 24, 25. So that would be positive 25. X squared, bring another term down, or you can bring them both down. Okay, so now I'm going to go again. What do I multiply this by to get the leftmost term here? Negative 4x. So now it's going to be negative 4x times x squared would be negative 4x cubed. Then negative 4x times negative 6x is 24x squared. Then negative 4x times 13, that would be negative 52x. Okay, then it's time to subtract, which means switch all these signs. Okay, so these are gone. Positive 25 and negative 24 would be 1x squared. And then negative 58 plus 52 would be negative 6x. And then bring down that 13. Okay, then you're going to ask yourself one more time, what can I multiply x squared by to get x squared? And that's 1. Okay, 1 times x squared, x squared. 1 times negative 6x, negative 6x. 1 times 13, positive 13. Now subtract. Okay, and you can see everything cancels, leaving you with nothing. So where you're at at this point is the original function 3x to the 4th minus 22x cubed plus 64x squared minus 58x plus 13 um, in factor form can be written as the factor that we got here. And this came from the solutions that they gave us. We multiplied, we turned these solutions into factors, multiplied them out, and got this little mini polynomial. That got divided into the main function, which give us another polynomial. So that means that this times the one that you got in the quotient are the things that provided the answers here. They provide all of the zeros here, two of which you already know. Okay, so if the question was for you to find the remaining zeros, in other words, the remaining solutions, just realize that this came from the solutions that you already know. So you don't want to turn around and, and continue messing around with that because if you were to try and solve that, it's just going to give you those same two solutions again. However, this new one that you came up with by dividing this into the main function that, if you work with that to try and get the rest of the solutions, you'll have the remaining zeros. So 3x squared minus 4x plus 1. You want to know what zeros result from that, which means you're going to either have to solve this by quadratic formula, or you can try to factor it. If you try to factor it and it doesn't factor, then you go to the quadratic formula. Um, okay, so let's see. If I was going to factor this by splitting the middle term, which I have suggested whenever the leading coefficient on a second degree trinomial, whenever the leading coefficient is bigger than one, I have been using splitting the middle term, which calls for you to find two numbers that multiply together to give you the a times c value. Those same two numbers have to add up to give you the b value. In this case, very easy to find because these numbers are so small. Negative 3 times negative 1 give you 3. 
and negative 3 plus negative 1 give you negative 4. So it works out there and there. And once you have found these two numbers that satisfy both of these steps right here, you're ready to split the middle term. Okay, so this is going to be 3x squared, and instead of negative 4x, it'll be negative 3x minus 1x plus 1. Okay, then we're going to factor by grouping, taking the 3x out of the first two terms, which leaves us with x minus 1. Um, let's see, taking negative 1 out of these back two terms, which would leave us with the same thing, x minus 1. This times this is negative x, this times this is 1. Likewise, this times this is 3x squared, and this times this is negative 3x. So, almost have this factored. Now what they have in common is the x minus 1. And the 3x minus 1, the first two GCFs that we pulled out, go in the other parentheses. And now it's all factored. So that brand new um, factor, which we got by finding the quotient using this mini polynomial that came from the zeros that we were given, well, that has led us all the way to this and now we can find the remaining zeros. So these are by no means easy problems. They have many steps and I've even shortcutted them at various places within the problem. So it is, this is what it is. All right, so getting the rest of the solutions. X minus one is equal to zero. So x equal to 1 is one of the solutions that we did not know from the very beginning, but we're able to find ourselves. You are required to show this work. You need to be able to show the work. You cannot put this in the calculator because you're, you will erase any need to know any kind of theory, any of the theorems, and any of the algebra solving skills. So please don't be disillusioned about what you need to do to show work. It is very blatantly being shown to you in all the lecture videos as well as the practice exam videos and you must demonstrate that you know how to um, show those methods and procedures as well for solving by hand. Okay, the other solution here, 3x minus 1. This is 3x equal to 1, divide by 3, divide by 3, and you have x equal to 1 third. So those are the solutions that we're missing from number 46. Use it to find the remaining zeros. Okay, so the one of the remaining zeros that was not given here, but we knew it from the conjugate Harris theorem was 3 minus 2i. So it's either of these solutions. And then we just found two solutions ourselves, which were 1 and 1 third. So 1 and 1 third, and this was from the conjugate pairs theorem. So C. Okay. Moving on, last two problems. So here's number 47, problem number 47, let's see what this says. Find all the zeros of the function and write the polynomial as a product of linear factors. Okay, so you can use any method you want as long as you are showing the bulk of the work by hand. So one thing you could do here is you could just try to factor right from the get-go. Okay, if you can factor here, let's see what would happen. Find all the zeros, because factoring it leads into finding the zeros. So we could try that, and if that doesn't work, when you can't factor, then you could use other theorems like listing the possible zeros 
rational zeros and then coming at them through synthetic division. So you're kind of, you know, being given some leeway as to how you're going to start this problem. Minus x squared. I think this one will factor, though, because I can see that the front two terms as well as the back two terms have um, common factors. So we could try to use grouping here. Let's see, like if we look at these two terms, we could take out an x squared. That would leave us with x minus 1. This times this is x cubed. This times this is the negative x squared. Then you can look at these two terms. Notice that they have 25 in common. 25 times x is that, 25 times negative 1. So now it is working. Factor by grouping is working because both of these terms have x minus 1 in common. So you can take that out as the common term. And what goes in the other parentheses are the first two GCFs that you took out, x squared plus 25. OK, so this is third degree. Therefore, we have exactly three complex zeros. Remember, complex numbers can be uh, integers. They can be completely imaginary, or they can be a mixture of both, having a real and an imaginary portion as part of the complex numbers. So you can tell what the zero of this is just by, because you know, you sometimes you can look at the factors and tell exactly what would zero it out. So one of the zeros. So third degree means you're looking for three zeros. So one of the zeros is positive one because a one plugged in here would zero this out. What would zero this out? Well, nothing that's real. And if we look at the directions here, it said find all the zeros. It didn't say just find the real zeros. So we're going to go on to mess around with this other factor and figure out what makes it zero since it's not obvious by just observation. We would bring this over here. The minute you get into a situation where you have x squared equal to a negative, that means you're going to get imaginary solutions because you'd have to take the square root here to get rid of the square. Therefore, you'd have to take the square root on this side as well. And taking the square root of a negative value is what creates imaginary numbers. So square root of, you know, this negative 25 is negative 1 times 25. So you're basically taking the square root of negative 1, and you're taking the square root of 25. Square root of negative 1 is just i. It comes out from underneath the radical as just i. The 25 remains underneath there, and then you have to realize that square root of 25 is 5. So 5i with a plus or minus in front of it. So those are the two solutions. And you can do that all at once right here. You could just go, that's i, and that's 5i. Five, five you don't have to go through this step right here if you don't want to. OK, so now I have um, the other zeros. The other zeros are positive and negative 5i. Positive 5i, negative 5i. So there they all are right there. And then what they've asked you to do is to take these zeros and write this polynomial as a product of linear factors. So if you wanted to write this as a product of linear factors, it's just x minus 1. And instead of writing this other factor in its second degree, or what we call quadratic form, you're going to write it in its linear form. And you can use these zeros right here to write it in its linear form. So it's going to be x minus positive 5i and x minus negative 5i for that last um, solution right there, that last zero, which would end up being x plus 5i. So there is this polynomial all factored into its distinct linear factors. Okay, that's number 47. So we had an x minus 1, an x plus 5i, and an x minus 5i. So 47 is d. Okay, then 48. <clears throat> so 
This time we have a fourth degree function. So that means we should have four solutions or four zeros. Okay, so let's see. All right, so one of the, let me see, what else did they give us here? Okay, so then the last one we tried factoring. We could try doing the same thing here. This is a, uh, this, is a this is a trinomial, which is actually in quadratic form. As long as this degree is double this, you can, you can uh, factor this as though it was x squared plus 29x plus 100. Because the leading coefficient is a 1, you don't need the splitting the middle term. You can just go into these two steps to get this factored. What two numbers multiply together to give you the C value, not A times C, that's for when you're doing splitting the middle term. C value is the 100. But those numbers that you come up with that multiply to give you 100, they have to also add to give you 29. And that's pretty easy. It's 25 times 4. Okay, this times this is 100, this plus this is 29. So, breaking up the first term, instead of x and x, it'll be x squared times x squared. You have to take the square root of that front term to know what goes here and here. Taking the square root of anything within an even degree, you just divide it by 2. You can do it for any degree. Taking the square root, you just divide by 2. So you get x squared that goes there and there. And then the numbers that you found here were 25, positive 25, and positive 4. Use the signs right here that you discovered when you were trying to figure out uh, what multiplied to give you 100 and what added to give you 29. Okay, so now if you're going to try and find... Uh, the solutions, because again, look at these instructions said, write this as a product. Oh, well, it is a product right now, but it said write it as a product of linear factors, first degree, and these are not first degree factors. But if you find the solutions for each of these factors, you will be able to rewrite this as a product of linear factors, and you will have four factors, because this was fourth degree when we began, so you should have four different factors here. Okay, so solutions for x squared plus 25, pretty easy. Just use the square root property. Just bring this over here at what point it becomes negative 25. Take the square root here, square root here, but don't forget to report the positive as well as the negative root. So square root of 25 is 5, square root of negative 1, that negative 1 coefficient is i. Likewise, do the same thing for the x squared plus 4. <clears throat> Bring this 4 to the other side, you end up with x squared equal to negative 4. And then um, if you're going to try and solve for x. Just take the square root there, square root there. Don't forget to report both the positive and negative root. So that's plus or minus 2i. Okay, then if you want to take a shot at writing this in factored form one more time, but as linear factors, it would be the following. Okay, so at one point you had it written like this, x squared plus 25 and x squared plus 4. But in finding the solutions that are derived from these second degree factors, you found out that this can be broken down using positive 5i and negative 5i. So right now I'm rewriting this. x minus 5i and then x minus negative 5i, which is x plus 5i. Then to rewrite this, now that I know what the solutions for it are, this can be written as x 
minus positive 2i, and this last one would be x minus negative 2i, because we had both a positive 2i and a negative 2i. And to put them in factor forms, you have to go x minus the actual solutions. Right, so this double negative would turn into that. And there you go. You have finally taken this from two second degree factors to all linear factors, all first degree factors. Okay, that concludes all 48 problems in the practice test for exam one pre-calculus.